Hi everyone, welcome to Facepalm Moments of the Week. In this week's episode, I have Facepalm Moments and things that you should know about. Kicking off this week's news, Prosperity Gospel Preacher, people who don't understand why I need a jet don't understand God's word. I've grouped some of the stories together today by themes, and this theme in the Facepalm Moments are the con men. Atlanta Prosperity Gospel Minister and megachurch pastor, Crayflo Dollar, briefly addressed his desire for a multi-million dollar Gulfstream G650 jet over the weekend, saying people who criticized him didn't have a godly worldview. See, don't get upset when the world says stuff and talks about stuff and all that. They are just looking through the wrong lens. They don't understand, Crayflo said in a sermon uploaded to his ministry's website. What does a preacher need with an airplane? They don't know, the preacher added. They'll never know because they're not looking through the word. They will never know, never, never know. It is the lamest excuse in the, in the world, I think, when you approach a Christian with a Bible verse where there's a contradiction and their answer is, well, if you had the Holy Spirit in you, you could see how that's not a contradiction. That's to me, that's basically saying, I'm not thinking, I'm just asserting that, that this thing exists. I'm just going to say it because it's in the book. And it's the same thing. They're not looking through the word. That means that they're not looking through your bullshit. That's a good thing. Pastor at Passion for Truth Church sentenced to prison for swindling the elderly. A Missouri pastor at a church called Passion for Truth Ministries will serve prison time for lying to and defrauding elderly investors, according to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Jim Staley, 40, was sentenced to seven years in prison and ordered to repay elderly investors $3.3 million. He pleaded guilty to four counts of wire fraud and profited $570,000 in the scam of elderly people who trusted him because of his Christian faith and family values. Some of them were suffering from dementia. I know that there are pastors and priests and other people in the church who go out there and do good work but it seems to be a real problem within the Christian faith community that people aren't taking moral responsibility when people go out and preach these false gospels. It's easy enough to condemn them. It's not, not as easy to actually go out and explain why they're con men and why people shouldn't be listening to them. But if Christians want me to take their religion seriously, then it shouldn't produce these kinds of individuals. Pastor lashes out at false Reverend John Oliver for mocking predatory televangelists. Again, just somebody who's really out of touch with reality. Christian minister Jennifer LeClaire said Oliver shouldn't mock what you don't understand, calling him a false reverend. LeClaire, who operates the Awakening House of Prayer, admitted there are abusive churches, but she does believe in the concept of seed faith. The idea of giving money to a church will result in returns for the giver. We have to be careful not to paint everyone who believes for an airplane or sows a seed to get out of debt as a heretic. I've read that sentence twice and I've tried to make it make sense. I think there's some poor sentence construction going on there. I do believe in supernatural debt cancellation, Claire writes. And I don't believe we should mock so-called prosperity preachers, even if we don't believe they hear from God. Nor do I believe we should insinuate that God is cursing at them, as Oliver did. Hmm. Where does it say in the Gospels about supernatural debt cancellation or the idea that if you um, plant a seed faith, it's going to come back as anything except the kingdom of God? It really is kind of shocking to me the way that these so-called Christians don't actually know what Jesus said about wealth, which is unambiguous. Wealth was a hindrance to getting into the kingdom of God. He said that it was easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle as literally an eye of a needle than for a rich man to gain entrance into the kingdom of heaven. He said that woe to you who are wealthy because you've already had your reward. And it really shows how superficial, uninformed, and basically, you know, out there to be frauds, the people who defend these practices are. They're using faith as a way to make money, not as a way to improve people's lives. And this is a problem with religion. When you make people's jobs depend on collecting money, they will sell you all kinds of religious bullshit to keep that money flowing in. Family Research Council VP. 
female Navy SEALs violate the laws of nature and should expect consequences. One of the other themes that I'm picking up on in today's news segments that I'm putting together are is a tendency, especially within, you know, here in, in the U.S. and Christianity, but I think um, probably, you know, obviously in Islam too, and I would assume in Judaism, but this uh, really boxing people into a, a narrow category based on their sex and thinking that because, let's say, having a child, giving birth is a natural function, that somehow it's also a normal function, that that's what women should do, that normality is attached to our, our bodies and what happens in nature is therefore normal. And that's a false equivalence and it's a constructed equivalence because women do a lot of things because of our bodies and our, our nature, but it doesn't mean that that's the only thing we can do or the only thing we should do. So moving on, kind of like looking at this topic now from this perspective. Retired General Jerry Boykin served as executive vice president for the Family Research Council, warned that women Navy SEALs should expect consequences for violating the laws of nature. Speaking to Fox News, he agreed that two women who recently passed the Army Ranger course deserved a lot of credit, but predicted that they would never be allowed to serve in a Ranger battalion. I'm on record as saying, I do not believe that women belong in infantry units and special operations units, Boykin noted. I wish the leadership in our military was more focused on the readiness of our military. Boykin argued that the conditions that Rangers and Navy SEALs face were as primal as you can get. You cannot violate the laws of nature without expecting some consequences, he insisted. The people that advocated for this have never lived out in a rucksack in a combat situation. I think what he's saying here is that meritocracy doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that we have the best people. What's important is that we limit human ability and define people based on Bronze Age views. And that is the kind of thinking that, frankly, I'm hoping is dying out. Woman marries Jesus Christ, becomes consecrated virgin. If someone wants to be a virgin or asexual for their whole life, that's cool. I, that's, like, I have no opinion on the subject because it's not my life and it's none of my business. But what seems pathological in this practice to me is the idea that women are basically defined by their virginity. So it's not about, let's say, being asexual or having a low sex drive. She is choosing to marry Jesus in order to remain a virgin. So it's all about, it's like really defining her by her status, her hymen, and her relation, her hymen's relationship to men. That's the way that's the framework with which i think a lot of religious institutions come to women's lives in the first place and so this just for me was like um you know you you aren't really marrying jesus one because he doesn't exist and two because if you marry someone you actually want to share your life with them not just talk to yourself in your head but let's see what the story has to say jessica hayes an indiana high school teacher married the love of her life on august 15 in a touching, albeit irregular, ceremony. Contrary to what one might expect, Hayes was not marrying a boyfriend. She was marrying Jesus Christ. Standing alone in a bridal gown at the altar of the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the 38-year-old dropped to the floor. When the ceremony finished, Hayes joined a small yet deeply devout group of Catholics known as Consecrated Virgins. Consecrated virgins occupy a uniquely private role in the Catholic faith. These individuals are not nuns, nor are they supported financially by any diocese. Instead, women who have chosen to become consecrated virgins live their lives traditionally, but dedicate themselves to prayer, penance, and service for their faith and church. Consecrated virgins commit themselves to lifelong celibacy, modest dress, and apostolic activity. There are only about 3,000 such women on earth. And of course, only women can be consecrated virgins because only women can marry Jesus. If he has 3,000 wives, is he technically a polygamist? Mayor cites seething anger at atheists. This is gonna be one of the stories where Christians violate the First Amendment by putting up their religious symbol on public property at taxpayer expense. And then when people point this out, they get angry and act defensive. Why? Because Christian privilege it teaches Christians that they're above the law, that they get special treatment, that they're better than everybody else, and therefore they get to do things that no one else can do because they're majority and it's our religion and blah, 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 blah. 
A New Mexico mayor is seeing red over an atheist group's wanting to take down a long-standing nativity scene on city property, citing seething anger at the interference in local business and vowing to fight to the finish. Bellin Mayor Jera Cordova said his towns maintained a nativity scene for decades as part of local history. It, but now the Freedom From Religion Foundation, woohoo, go Freedom From Religion Foundation, has sent a letter warning the display must come down because it violates the separation of church and state due to its location on public property. But Cordova says that's not going to happen. My first reaction was seething anger, he said to a local radio station. And then he insisted the display was historical, not overly religious. It's a nativity. How can you say it's not overly religious if it's depicting the nativity? Do you see how they twist things in their minds? Oh, it's not religion, it's history. It didn't even happen. And you want to call that history. And then he, then he comes out with this bullshit. Our town was named Belen for a reason, because our founders wanted it to be named after Bethlehem. And of course, what happened in Bethlehem was the birth of, birth of Christ, which is something we've expressed since our founding. The town is spelled B-E-L-E-N. Belen. That is nothing like Bethlehem. The Freedom From Religion Foundation says it doesn't care. And it also doesn't care that the majority of residents want to keep the scene at its present city park location. Because it violates the law! It's that little thing that they just keep glossing over. It's illegal. Oh, 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 well, when Christians break the law, it's not really breaking the law. Not like when everybody else does it. And related, Fox News has completely lost its mind. It's August 14th, and Elizabeth Hasselbeck is freaking out about the war on Christmas. Fox and Friends devoted a Fight for Faith segment this morning to the Freedom From Religion Foundation's attempt to have the city of Belen, New Mexico. I keep wanting to say Bellend. Look, if you're British, you're laughing right now. But if you're American, you might know what the Bellend of something might be. Apparently the mayor appeared on Fox and Friends and he said that he was prepared to take action as far as he can. And Hesselbeck agreed that he should, adding that the war on Christmas typically comes in the winter near December, but this is coming a little bit early. This isn't a seasonal issue. This is a nativity that comes up for Christmas. This has been part of your people's history there. It's always been illegal. What part of illegal do you not understand, Fox and Friends? Mayor in the town of New Mexico, Bellin, what don't you understand? It's not that hard. And here are some stories that you should know about. Children is property, the common root of religious child abuse and the pro-life movement. Why do the same people who fight against abortion argue that parents should have the right to hit their children and deny them medical care or education as some conservative Republicans have done recently? How can someone oppose family planning because a pill or IUD might have the rare and unintended consequence of interfering with implantation and then endorse beating a child which might have the rare and unintended consequence of battering her to death. These two positions fit together seamlessly only when we understand the Iron Age view of the child woven through the Bible and how that view has shaped the priorities and behavior of those who treat the Bible like the literally perfect Word of God. If that sounds interesting to you, check more for the link in the description box below and you can read the full article. New Atheism and Evolutionary Religious Studies, Clarifying Their Relationships. This is quite a good piece, and in order to get you more interested, I'm going to read a little bit from the middle section of it, just to give you a sense of what's going on inside. What is the relationship between the New Atheism and Evolutionary Religious Studies? This question is surprisingly complex and needs to be answered in at least three steps. Step one. They are alike in their rejection of the actively intervening God hypothesis. I am choosing my words carefully here. The concept of supernatural agents that actively intervene in the laws of nature and affairs of people is a perfectly good scientific hypothesis that has occupied center stage for centuries. It was rejected so thoroughly that it is, it is no longer taken seriously in scientific circles although anyone who wishes to spend their money testing it yet again is welcome to do so. The new atheists are deeply convinced about the non-existent of actively intervening gods, 
Religious scholars don't shout their convictions from the root rooftops, but their adherence to methodological naturalism amounts to the same thing. Finally, rejecting the actively intervening God hypothesis says nothing about other conceptions of divinity and religion, which need to be evaluated on their own terms. Step two, as a scholarly discipline, evolutionary religious studies is agnostic about what gets done with the knowledge that is created. The new atheism is oriented toward action. As someone who is trying to put evolutionary science in practical use for many topics, I regard activism as a good thing as long as it remains ethically and scientifically accountable. I therefore support some aspects of the new atheist agenda, such as the need to destigmatize atheism. Step 3. Whenever new atheists make claims about religion as a human phenomenon, their claims should respect the authority of empirical evidence, insofar as the new discipline of ERS has added to empirical knowledge of religion. The new atheists should be paying close attention to ERS. For the nerdy types out there who are going to find that article intriguing, links in the date box below. How secular families stack up. This was a piece I saw on secular talk and I found it so interesting I wanted to make sure that I put it in an episode of Face Paul Moments of the Week. I'm not going to read from this because I've been reading a lot in this episode so I'm just going to tell you what's in this article. It's an opinion piece that was written in the LA Times and it talks about the phenomenon of children being raised in secular homes, children being raised without religion, and now that there are enough of them to be studied, there is actually a sociologist, who's some, someone who's working with a longitudinal study of generations, who's actually started to follow the children of people who don't have religious beliefs. And this is what I will read out from the article. He was surprised by what he found when he looked at these children. High levels of family solidarity and emotional closeness between parents and non-religious youth, and strong ethical standards and moral values that had been clearly articulated as they were imparted to the next generation. He says, many non-religious parents were more coherent and passionate about their ethical principles than some of the religious parents in our study. The vast majority appeared to live goal-filled lives, characterized by moral direction and a sense of life having purpose. This is a really important article, I think, to get a really uh, to um, have some empirical evidence that you can be good without God. And in a lot of ways, not having God around as the default morality forces you to be more clear about what your morality is. Are you living in a post-Christian America? This, of course, is a story that makes me very happy. The percentage of Americans who are categorized as post-Christian has increased from 37% in 2013 to 44% in 2015, with the highest percentages residing in urban areas of the Northeast and Pacific Northwest. Across the United States, cities in every state are becoming more post-Christian, some at a faster rate than others. While 78% of Americans identify as Christian, Barna, this research group, used 15 metrics to track indifference to Christianity, and those surveyed had to meet nine of those factors to qualify as post-Christian. Individuals who met 12 or more of the factors were categorized as highly post-Christian. Some of the factors used to gauge categories included whether individuals identified as atheists have um, never made a commitment to Jesus, have not attended church in the last year, or have not read the Bible in the last week. America's most Christian influenced cities are all in the South, but they still experienced a slight decline in movement away from Christianity. I haven't really looked into this group too much, the Barna group, although I have used two of their studies. I think it's interesting, the idea of post-Christian, although I think post-Christian should apply to individuals and not to societies, because a society isn't necessarily just made up of Christians. But I think that if you do find more and more people who've never left religion, then I think what you're looking at is a post-religious society, and for people who have left Christianity, those are post-Christian. So I might quibble a little bit with their terms, but generally, these are good trends. Finally, the last thing I want to recommend you check out if you find it interesting is a report that was done by one of my favorite groups, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, about that's called Pray to Play. Here's a brief summary of what the report contains. 
Public universities and their employees cannot endorse, promote, or favor religion, yet many football coaches at public universities bring in chaplains, often from their own church or even members of their own family, to pray on and pray with students, with no regard for the rights of those students or the Constitution. These coaches are converting playing fields into mission fields, and public universities are doing nothing to halt this breach of trust. They are failing their student-athletes. The purpose of this report is to expose this unconstitutional system, encourage universities to fix it, and stimulate further efforts to protect students' rights of conscience. I love the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Every time I come across this, I just fall in love with them a little bit more. Hey, those are all the stories for this week, and I don't know if I'm going to have enough for a second episode. I guess it'll be a surprise. So either you'll see me as a sort of surprise episode in the first part of next week, or you'll see me back here next Friday. So until next time, whenever that is, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you back here on Facebook Moments of the Week. Bye. Hey, just so you know, I will be putting out a video about my Patreon hangout in September. We're going to be looking at methods of studying history, so historical methods and looking at the historical Jesus. Um, probably, this looks like it might be a two-parter. There's a lot going on in that question. But the first part of the hangout, we're definitely going to talk about historical methods, sources, how we approach the sources, and rigorous ways to deal with the evidence. Because in my opinion, if you can't agree on what constitutes knowledge and what the standards are, then there's no point going forward in discussion because you'll just be talking past each other. So the point of the hangout is to really engage in the idea of methodology and the historical method and understanding what that is and deciding what about that we like, what we don't like, what we want to take away, and also understanding how academics use it to come to their conclusions. So if that sounds really nerdy and fun, check out my Patreon video. I'll put a link. Oh, it goes here. Okay, that's it now. Bye!